Section 50 of The Shakespeare Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary MacLeod. The Winter's Tale, Part 1. At the Palace of Leontes, the Oracle Speaks. At the Palace of Leontes. Leontes, King of Sicilia, and Polixenes, King of Bohemia, had always been the closest and dearest friends. Trained together in childhood, and as boys never apart, a deep rooted affection had sprung up between them, and when the necessities of their royal birth and dignities made separation necessary, by calling each to rule over his own kingdom, they still kept up the warmest intercourse by gifts, letters, and loving embassies. Both in due course married. Hermione, wife of Leontes, was a noble and beautiful woman, and they had one child, a princely boy called Mamilius. Polixenes, in Bohemia, had also one boy, Florizel, within a month of the same age as Mamilius. When the children were five years old, Polixenes came to pay a visit to Leontes, and for many months he remained at Sicilia, renewing the happy days of boyhood with his old friend, and made cordially welcome by Hermione for the sake of her husband. But at last the time came when Polixenes must turn his steps homeward. He had been long absent from Bohemia, and matters of state required his presence. Leontes pressed him warmly to remain, even if it were only for a few days longer, but Polixenes was firm. Then Leontes bade his wife try her powers of persuasion. Glad to please her husband, and liking their visitor for his own sake, Hermione merely announced that she absolutely refused to let Polixenes go. It was useless for him to pretend excuses. Bohemia was getting on very well without him. Polixenes must learn, she said, that a lady's verily was just as potent as a lord's, and she had said verily he must stay, either as her prisoner or her guest. He could take his choice, whichever he preferred, but one of them he certainly should be. Polixenes could not be so churlish as to resist such a sweet pleader, and accordingly he said he would stay for another week. But no sooner was this point settled than a strange fit of jealous rage took possession of Leontes. To his unhappy temper it seemed that Hermione was showing far too much affection to this friend of his, and he was enraged that Polixenes had consented to do for her what he had refused to do for himself. With growing wrath he watched their light-hearted cordiality, for Hermione was gay and joyous by nature, and her innocent playfulness was always ready to sparkle forth in merry words. Instead of trying to banish his sullen suspicions, Leontes chose to keep brooding over them, and presently they overmastered his reason to such an extent that he confided them to one of his lords, called Camillo, and ordered him to find means of poisoning Polixenes. In vain did the honest old courtier try to argue with Leontes, begging him to put aside such delusions, for they were most dangerous, and protesting there was no truth whatever in them. Leontes refused to listen to reason and Camillo thought the best plan was to appear to yield. He therefore said he would undertake to get rid of Polixenes, provided that after he was gone, Leontes would promise to treat his queen exactly the same as formerly. This, Leontes replied, it was his intention to do. Camillo, however, instead of poisoning Polixenes, warned him of the danger he was in, and the king of Bohemia, already put on his guard by the frowning looks which met him in all directions, determined to leave at once knowing that it would be impossible to continue in the service of Leontes, when the latter discovered what he had done, Camillo accepted an offer from Polixenes to join his followers, and the two left Sicilia that very night. Leontes, hearing of their hasty departure, was more convinced than ever in his suspicions, and in spite of the indignant remonstrances of all his lords, his next step was to order the imprisonment of his noble queen. Not long after she was shut up in prison, Hermione had a little baby girl, but in his fury against his wife, Leontes refused to see his little daughter, or to treat her in any way as a child of his own. All the court ladies were devoted to their beloved queen, and not one of them but believed in her innocence, and was indignant to the cruel way in which she was treated. But not contented with simply pitying her, one of them, Paulina, wife of the lord Antigonus, determined to make an effort to get justice done. 
she thought that perhaps at the sight of the innocent little child the king's stubborn heart might relent paulina was a woman of firm and dauntless character she went to the prison calmly carried off the infant in the face of some feeble objections from the jailer then proceeding to the palace she insisted on making her way into the presence of the king leontes ordered her to be removed but the spirited lady drew herself up with such an air of defiance that for a moment no man dared lay hands on her of my own accord i will go but first i'll do my errand she said haughtily then kneeling before the king she placed the child at his feet the good queen for she is good hath brought you forth a daughter she said here it is she commends it to your blessing but her appeal was useless with uncontrolled fury leontes bade her be gone and to take the child with her paulina cared nothing for his wild torrent of abuse but unflinchingly expressed her opinion that he was acting in a most senseless manner and said that his cruel usage of the queen would make him scandalous to the world the outspoken lady was at last hustled away but she left the child behind her bidding the king look to it paulina's husband antigonus had taken up the infant in pity and now leontes turned on him with fury accusing him of having set on his wife and ordering him to take away the child and kill it antigonus respectfully denied that he had set on his wife and the other lords confirmed what he said and further besought on their knees that leontes would relent from his horrible purpose softening a little leontes grudgingly consented that the child might live but he forthwith commanded antigonus on his allegiance to carry it away to some remote and desert place quite out of his dominions and there leave it without more mercy to its own protection and the favour of the climate chance might nurse it or end it antigonus though sore at heart did as he had sworn to the king he would do and carried away the child that night as he was in the ship that conveyed them away from the domain of sicilia there came to him a dream the spirit of hermione stood before him clad in pure white robes her eyes flashing fire when their fury was spent she spoke thus good antigonus since fate against thy better disposition had made thy person for the throw out of my poor babe according to thine oath there are places remote enough in bohemia there weep and leave it crying and because the babe is counted lost for ever prithee call it perdita for this ungentle business put on thee by my lord thou never more shalt see thy wife paulina and so wailing the vision melted into the air in accordance with this dream antigonus carried the babe into the country of bohemia unable to weep but his heart bleeding for pity at the cruel deed which his oath enjoined on him he placed it tenderly on the ground as he turned away he was pursued by a savage bear which made him take to instant flight he had not therefore the happiness of knowing that the little child found a speedy preserver for within a few minutes an aged shepherd in search of some strayed sheep came that way good luck what have we here he cried in astonishment mercy on us a bairn a very pretty bairn a boy or a girl i wonder a pretty one a very pretty one i'll take it up for pity yet i'll tarry till my son come he hallooed but even now whoa ho ho the shepherd's son coming up to wonder over the strange discovery soon noticed there was a heap of gold hidden away in the costly wrappings of the little fondling and rejoicing in their luck the rustics carried perdita home to their shepherd's cottage the oracle speaks leontes in order to avoid the reproach of tyranny which he feared his people had only too much reason to fasten on him decreed that the queen should be openly tried in a court of justice and herself appear in person to answer the charges he had seen fit to bring against her he had dispatched messengers to the temple of apollo at delphos to consult the oracle and on their return the trial was appointed to take place the messengers had brought back the answer of the oracle in a sealed cover and at the proper moment during the trial the seals would be broken and the verdict would be read in open court hermione's answer to the accusations brought against her was an indignant denial she declared that she had never had for polixenes more affection than was right and fitting for any honourable lady to have for her guest such an affection as leontes himself had commanded her to bestow on the friend who had loved him from infancy 
she had never conspired with camillo against leontes all she knew was that camillo was an honest man and she was entirely ignorant why he had left the court the only effect these words had on leontes was to make him more violent than ever he told his wife that as she had already been past all shame so she was now past all truth and he threatened her with the punishment of death sir spare your threats said hermione with noble dignity the spectre you would frighten me with i seek to me life is no great thing to be desired the crown and comfort of my life your favour is lost for i feel it to be gone though i know not how it went my second joy my first-born child i am debarred from his presence like one infectious my third comfort my dear little innocent baby has been torn from me i have myself been branded with disgrace on every hand and lastly i have been hurried here to this place in the open court while i am still weak and ill and unfitted to appear now my liege tell me what blessings i have here while i am alive that i should fear to die therefore proceed but yet hear this mistake me not i do not beg for life i prize it not a straw but for mine honour i will not have that condemned without any proof except what your jealous surmises awake my lords i refer me to the oracle apollo be my judge the counsellors present declared that hermione's request was altogether just and ordered the messengers from delphos to be summoned the latter then handed the officer of the court the sealed letter from the oracle which he forthwith opened and read in the presence of all the oracle spoke thus hermione is innocent polixenes blameless camillo a true subject leontes a jealous tyrant the innocent babe is his daughter and the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found now blessed be the great apollo shouted all the lords praised cried hermione hast thou read truth demanded leontes ay my lord even so as it is here set down said the officer of the court there is no truth at all in the oracle exclaimed leontes the trial shall proceed this is mere falsehood but at that instant came a terrible shock to the headstrong king a servant entered with the mournful tidings that the young prince the noble boy mamilius was dead the separation from his beloved mother and dread as to a possible fate had so wrought on the imagination of the sensitive child that he had died of grief on hearing of this new calamity hermione's fortitude gave way and she fell fainting to the ground leontes stubborn spirit began to quail he saw in this blow the wrath of heaven against his injustice he admitted that he had too much believed his suspicions he ordered that the queen should be carried away and every remedy tenderly applied to restore her to life in his new terror he hastily began to make good resolutions he would be reconciled with polixenes he would woo the queen again he would recall camillo whom he forthwith proclaimed a man of mercy and truth for by his piety and humanity he had saved the life of polixenes when leontes would have poisoned him but these good resolves came too late even as leontes was speaking paulina rushed back into the court weeping and wringing her hands with burning words that went straight to the truth she hurled the bitterest reproaches at the king denouncing his tyranny and worse than childish jealousy which had led to one evil after another he had betrayed polixenes attempted to poison camillo's honour cast forth to the crows his baby daughter had indirectly brought about the death of the young prince but last beyond all these things worst of all the queen was dead oh thou tyrant she cried almost distracted with grief do not repent these things for they are heavier than all thy woes can stir therefore betake thee to nothing but despair a thousand knees ten thousand years together naked fasting upon a barren mountain and still winter in storm perpetual could not move the cause to look on thee with pity go on go on murmured the conscience-stricken leontes i have deserved all tongues to talk their bitterest paulina seeing that leontes was sincere in his repentance now softened and in her impulsive fashion asked pardon for her rash and impetuous words but leontes was honest enough to own that she had spoken nothing but truth and he would not let her retract what she had said prithee bring me to the dead bodies of my wife and son he said one grave shall be for both on it shall appear the cause of their death for my perpetual shame once a day i'll visit the chapel where they lie 
and tears shed there shall be my recreation so the unhappy king strove in vain by a tardy penance to atone for the wrongs he had done end of section fifty section fifty one of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by thomas peter the shakespeare story book by mary macleod the winter's tale part two a queen of curds and cream the oracle fulfilled a queen of curds and cream sixteen years had rolled away since the day when the shepherd had found the little deserted baby and taken it to his own cottage the old man had prospered since those days and from having almost nothing had risen to large estates the maiden who passed as his daughter had grown into such rare loveliness that the report of her beauty spread through all the country of bohemia and even reached the palace of the king polixenes it will be remembered had one son florizel who was the same age as the young prince mamilius of sicilia dead sixteen years before prince florizel at this time was about twenty-one years old it happened one day when he was out hawking that his falcon flew across the land belonging to the shepherd and seeing perdita florizel was so struck by her charm and beauty that he at once fell in love with her from that day he was a constant visitor at the shepherd's house so much so that the king his father noticed his frequent absence from home and taking counsel with camillo they decided to go themselves to the shepherd's house in disguise to see what could be the attraction that was always taking the prince to this homely dwelling the day they chose for their expedition was the great feast of the sheep shearing when all the shepherds and shepherdesses collected together to make merry among the company in the guise of a shepherd came florizel who was only known to the adopted father of perdita as doricles and whom he imagined to be nothing but a humble swain the old shepherd had provided a goodly entertainment for his guests and seeing that perdita was inclined to be too shy and retiring he insisted on her taking full direction of everything reminding her that she was the hostess of the meeting and that she must bid all these unknown friends welcome come quench your blushes and present yourself that which you are mistress of the feast he said come on and bid us welcome to your sheep shearing so your good flock shall prosper thus urged perdita made a brave effort to conquer her girlish shyness and with the prettiest grace possible she went up to the two strangers whom her father had pointed out and bade them welcome these strangers were polixenes and camillo calling to her a shepherdess who was carrying a basket of flowers perdita selected some and gave a little posy to each of the strangers reverend sirs for you there's rosemary and rue these keep seeming and savour all the winter long grace and remembrance be to you both and welcome to our shearing polixenes and camillo were enchanted with the loveliness and modest grace of this lowly-born damsel who in spite of her bashfulness showed that she could answer with wit and intelligence when they began to converse with her for the king and camillo perdita had chosen the flowers of middle summer hot lavender mint savoury marjoram the marigold that goes to bed with the sun and with him rises weeping these are the flowers of middle summer and these she thought suitable to give to men of middle age but when a bevy of fair young shepherdesses approached in all the first sweet bloom of early girlhood she longed to have some flowers of the spring that would become their time of day o oh, proserpina for the flowers now that frighted thou let'st fall from dis's wagon she cried daffodils that come before the swallow dares and take the winds of march with beauty violets dim but sweeter than the lids of juno's eyes or cytherea's breath pale primroses that die unmarried ere they can behold bright phoebus in his strength bold oxlips and the crown imperial lilies of all kinds the flower de luce being one. Oh, these i lack to make you garlands of this is the prettiest low-born lass that ever ran on green sward cried polixenes when a few minutes later perdita led off with florizel the rustic dance of shepherds and shepherdesses 
nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself too noble for this place good sooth agreed camillo she is the queen of curds and cream pray good shepherd what fair swain is this who dances with your daughter asked polixenes of their aged host the shepherd replied that he was called doricles and boasted that he was well off he had it only on the young man's own report but he believed it for he looked like truth he says he loves my daughter i think so too and to be plain i think there is not half a kiss to choose which loves the other best she dances featly said the king so she does everything though i report it who should be silent if young doricles do light upon her she shall bring him that which he dreams not of but in spite of the king's admiration for perdita he had no mind that the heir to the throne of bohemia should wed the daughter of a lowly shepherd as the feast went on and became merrier and more uproarious florizel could no longer restrain his affection and calling the two strangers as witness he begged that the contract of marriage between himself and perdita should be there and then concluded the aged shepherd was quite willing to join the hands but polixenes bade the young man pause had he no father he asked and did he know of this he neither does nor shall replied florizel methinks the father is at the nuptial of his son a guest that best becomes the table said polixenes was the father incapable stupid with age or illness crazy childish no answered florizel to all this but he nevertheless persisted in refusing to let him know what was taking place then Polixenes threw off his disguise and revealed himself as the king. All was now consternation. He terrified the shepherd by saying he would probably be hanged for letting his daughter entrap the young prince. He commanded Florizel to part instantly from Perdita and follow him to the court, and he threatened the maiden with cruel death if ever she dared henceforth to encourage his son by the slightest word or caress. The old shepherd was in despair at the king's displeasure, for it meant ruin to them all. And perhaps a shameful death for himself perdita prepared with a breaking heart to give up her lover she had often warned him what would come of this she was no fitting mate for a prince her dream of happiness was over being now awake i'll queen it no inch further but milk my ears and weep she murmured sorrowfully but florizel had no intention of giving up the bride to whom he had plighted his troth not for bohemia not for all the pomp that the sun saw, or the earth held, or the sea hid, would he break his oath to his beloved. Camillo, who had remained behind when Polixenes wrathfully departed, tried to reason with the prince, but Florizel was resolute. For some time, fearing a possible event such as had now happened, he had had a ship prepared for flight, which was riding at anchor close by. He bade Camillo return to court and inform Polixenes that he had put to sea with Perdita, what course he meant to hold it would be better for camillo not to know or the prince to tell a plan now occurred to the good camillo by which he hoped to benefit every one concerned he still kept a warm feeling of affection for his late master leontes and often during his sixteen years of exile he had longed to return to sicilia he now proposed to florizel that he should carry perdita to the court of leontes where they would be certain to receive the warmest welcome from the repentant king who would be anxious to make every possible amends to the son for the way in which he had treated the father. Camillo, meanwhile, would stay with Polixenes, and do everything in his power to soften his resentment and reconcile him to his son's marriage. The Oracle Fulfilled After the departure of Florizel and Perdita, the shepherd's son, seeing the despair of the old man because of the disgrace he had fallen into, counseled him to go and tell the king that Perdita was no daughter of his. There is no other way but to tell the king she is a changeling, and none of your flesh and blood, he declared. She being none of your flesh and blood, your flesh and blood has not offended the king, and so your flesh and blood is not to be punished by him. Show those things you found about her, those secret things, all but what she has with her. This being done, let the law go whistle, I warrant you. I will tell the king all, every word, said the timorous old man. Yea, and his son's pranks, too who i may say is no honest man neither to his father nor to me to go about to make me the king's brother-in-law the worthy rustics at once put their intention into practice and hearing that the king had already left the palace in pursuit of his son they followed him to the seaside 
to deliver over the things which had been found with the deserted infant. Since the death of Hermione, Leontes had lived a life of penance and gravity, devoting himself to the memory of his lost wife and son. Some of his counsellors would fain have persuaded the king to marry again, but the impetuous lady, Paulina, faithful to her deeply wronged mistress, declared that there was no lady living that could be compared with her, or was fit to take her position as queen. Paulina reminded Leontes also of the words of the oracle, which had said that there would be no heir to the throne until that which was lost was found. Leontes, who was much more tractable than of old, and who knew now how to value the unflinching honesty of this outspoken lady, replied that he would never marry again until Paulina herself bade him do so. "'That shall be when your first queen breathes again. Never till then,' said Paulina. And matters were in this state when Florizel and Perdita reached Sicilia. The young pair received the warmest welcome from Leontes, but closely following their arrival came a messenger from Polixenes, begging Leontes to seize hold of the prince, who, casting off both his dignity and duty, had fled from his father and from his hopes with a shepherd's daughter. Polixenes himself had arrived in Sicilia, bringing with him the old shepherd, the seeming father of Perdita. But the momentary cloud was soon dispelled, and great and unexpected joy filled the whole country. The things which the aged shepherd had taken to Polixenes furnished full proof that the rescued little babe was no other than the long-lost daughter of Leontes, the mantle of Queen Hermione, her jewel on the neck of it, letters of Antigonus found with it, which they knew to be in his handwriting, the majesty of Perdita herself, which so closely resembled her mother, the nobility of her bearing, which nature showed was above her breeding, and many other evidences proclaimed her with all certainty to be the king's daughter. All was now rejoicing. Bonfires were lighted, and crowds ran about the streets, gossiping over the news, and wondering at all the strange things that were taking place. The meeting of the two kings, it was reported, was a sight never to be forgotten. Such a weeping for joy, casting up of eyes, and holding up of hands. Leontes, overcome with rapture at finding his daughter again, one moment embraced her, the next cried, Oh, thy mother, thy mother! Then he asked forgiveness of Polixenes, then embraced his son-in-law, once more flung his arms round his daughter, now thanked the old shepherd, who stood by like a weather-beaten relic of many kings' reigns. So with Paulina, joy and sorrow strove for utterance at the sight of the young princess. One moment she wept for the loss of her husband, whom the shepherd's son had seen killed by the bear. The next she was filled with rapture that the oracle was fulfilled. She lifted the princess from the ground, and so locked her in an embrace, as if she would pin her to her heart that she might no more be in danger of losing her. The princess was told of her mother's death, with the manner how she came by it, bravely confessed and lamented by the king himself, hearing that there was a wonderful statue of the queen, which had taken many years to make, and which was just completed, and in the keeping of Paulina. Perdita was most desirous to see it, and thither the royal party and all their company of lords and ladies now went. On arriving at Paulina's house, Leontes looked all about for the statue, but though Paulina led them through a gallery rich with many rare and beautiful objects, they did not see there what Perdita had come to look upon, the statue of her mother. At last they reached the chapel, and Leontes ventured to remind Paulina of the object of their visit. As she lived peerless, replied Paulina, so her dead likeness, I do well believe, excels whatever yet you looked upon, or hand of man hath done. Therefore I keep it lonely, apart. But here it is. Prepare to see the life as vividly mocked as ever still sleep mocked death. Behold, and say it is well. Paulina drew back a curtain, and there, beautiful and motionless before their eyes, stood the majestic image of the dead queen. For a moment they stood mute and breathless, gazing in amazement, for surely artists' cunning had never wrought so wonderful a representation of life. I like your silence, said Paulina. It the more shows off your wonder. But yet, speak. First you, my liege. Comes it not something near? Her natural posture, murmured Leontes. Chide me, dear stone, that I may say indeed thou art Hermione, or rather thou art she in thy not chiding, for she was as tender as infancy and grace. But yet, Paulina, Hermione was not so much wrinkled, Nothing so aged as this seems. Oh, not by much, said Polixenes. 
so much the more our carver's excellence said paulina which lets go by some sixteen years and makes her as if she lived now as now she might have done sighed leontes oh thus she stood even with such life of majesty warm life as now it coldly stands when first i wooed her give me leave said perdita and do not say it is superstition that i kneel and then implore her blessing lady dear queen that ended when i but began give me that hand of yours to kiss oh patience said paulina the statue is but newly fixed the colour is not dry she made a movement to draw the curtain saying that if they looked much longer they would presently think the statue moved but leontes implored her to let him gaze at it longer for the more he did so the more lifelike it appeared it seemed to breathe there was light in the eyes it recalled to him all his love and sorrow for the lost hermione let no man mock me he said for i will kiss it paulina begged him to forbear and again offered to draw the curtain and again he prevented her either forbear and at once leave the chapel or prepare for further amazement said paulina if you can behold it i'll make the statue move indeed descend and take you by the hand but then you'll think which i protest against i am assisted by wicked powers what you can make her do i am content to look on said leontes what to speak i am content to hear for it is as easy to make her speak as move then paulina bade music sound and as the soft strains floated through the chapel the statue of hermione stirred stepped down from its place and took leontes by the hand yes it was indeed hermione living and breathing as she had parted from her husband sixteen years ago his long sorrow and penance were over henceforth he would live in tenderest affection with his deeply cherished wife the faithful paulina was not left to spend her latter years in loneliness antigonus was dead but leontes reminded her that as she had found a second wife for him so he would find a second husband for her i'll not seek far he said to find thee an honourable husband for i partly know his mind come camillo and take by the hand this lady whose worth and honesty are richly noted and here proclaimed by us a pair of kings end of section fifty one Section 52 of The Shakespeare Story Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The Shakespeare Story Book by Mary McLeod. The Comedy of Errors, Part One, A Walk Through Ephesus. There was once a merchant of Syracuse called Aegeon, who had two baby sons, the one so like the other that it was impossible to tell them apart. At the time these children were born, Aegeon was traveling, for his business often compelled him to make long journeys. It happened that on the same day and in the self same inn a poor woman had also twin sons the parents being extremely poor and those being the days of slavery aegeon bought and brought up these children to attend on his own sons when they were still quite young aegeon and his wife started to return home on the voyage back a dreadful storm arose the sailors saved themselves in a boat, but left the merchant, his wife, and the children on the doomed vessel. The wife, seeing the fate that threatened them, bound one of her children and one of the twin slaves to a small mast. The merchant was equally heedful of the other two boys, and the children being thus disposed of, the father and mother also bound themselves, one to each mast. Presently the storm abated, the sun again shone forth, and by his light the merchant saw two ships in the distance, making towards them. 
one of which seemed to be from Corinth, the other from Epidaurus. But before they could reach them, their own ship was driven violently against a huge rock and split in two. Parents and children were tossed into the sea. The mother and the two elder boys were picked up by the fishermen of Corinth, and at length the merchant and the other two boys were rescued by the other ship. The latter would have pursued the fishermen and reft them of their prey, but that their ship was too slow of sail, so they had to pursue their way homeward. At eighteen years of age, the youngest boy became inquisitive after his brother, and begged his father to let him go in quest of him, taking with him his attendant, who was in the like plight as himself, Aegeon, himself longing to behold once more the wife and son whom he had lost, at last gave a reluctant consent. So Antiphilus of Syracuse and Dromio of Syracuse departed on their voyage of discovery. But time passed, and they did not return. At last, Aegeon determined to go himself in search of them. Five years he spent in the furthest Greece, roaming through the bounds of Asia, till at last, coasting homeward, he came to Ephesus, hopeless of finding the lost boys, yet loath to leave unsought either that or any place which harbored men. It happened at that time, owing to the enmity and discord between the towns of Ephesus and Syracuse, that it had been agreed in solemn synod by the citizens of both to omit no traffic with the adverse town. If any native of Ephesus were seen at Syracuse, or if any native of Syracuse came to the Bay of Ephesus, he was to die, and his goods were to be confiscated at the disposal of the duke, unless he could levy a thousand marks to pay the penalty and ransom himself. Aegeon, being a native of Syracuse, on arriving in Ephesus, was arrested under the law, and brought before the duke. His possessions not amounting to the value of even a hundred marks, he was condemned to die. The duke of Ephesus, on hearing the pitiful tale which Aegeon related, would gladly, out of compassion, have released him, but it was not possible to recall the sentence of death, which had been passed, unless the fine were paid. The duke granted what favor lay in his power, and gave the merchant a day's grace, bidding him seek all the friends he had in Ephesus, and try to beg or borrow the sum required in order to save his life. Unknown to Aegeon, it happened that not only the son of whom he was in search, but also the other son whom he had lost years before, was at that time in Ephesus. The latter had been settled there for many years, and was married to a wife called Adriana. Both sons of the merchant were known by the same name, Antephilus, and both their slave attendants were called Dromeo. The resemblance which had been so strong in the infancy of the two set of twins still continued, and after the arrival in Ephesus of Antiphilus and Dromeo from Syracuse, this resemblance was to lead to endless confusion. The news that a merchant of Syracuse had been arrested soon spread through the city, Antiphilus, who had just arrived after a long journey, was warned by a friendly merchant, who, paying him a large sum of money which he had in keeping for him, counseled Antiphilus not to let it be known he came from Syracuse. Antiphilus dispatched his servant Dromeo with the money back to the inn, the centaur, where they were lodging, saying he would return there in an hour to dinner. In the meantime, he intended to walk about and view the city, lamenting the while that he had not yet found the lost mother and brother of whom he was in search. Much to the surprise of Antiphilus, he presently saw a man approaching, whom he took to be his servant Dromeo. As a matter of fact, it was his servant's twin brother, who, for his part, mistook Antiphilus for his own master. "'What now? How chances it you are returned so soon?' demanded Antiphilus of Syracuse. "'Return so soon? Rather approach too late,' retorted Dromeo of Ephesus. "'The capon burns, the pig falls from the spit, the clock hath struck twelve. And he went on to say that his mistress was very angry, because the dinner was getting cold, and his master had not returned. "'Stop, sir,' said Antiphilus, 
checking his rapid flow of words. Tell me this, I pray. Where have you left the money I gave you? Oh, sixpence that I had on Wednesday last to pay the saddler for my mistress's crupper? The saddler had it, sir. I did not keep it. I am not in a sportive humor now, said Antiphilus sternly, for he knew that Dromeo was a merry fellow who loved the jest. Tell me, and dally not, where is the money? We being strangers here, how dare you trust so great a charge out of your own custody? But Dromeo persisted that Antiphilus had given him no money, and kept on begging him to come home to his wife, who was waiting dinner for him at the Phoenix. Antiphilus, at last quite losing his temper at what he imagined was his servant's impertinence, fell on him and began to beat him, whereupon Dromeo took to his heels and disappeared. Upon my life! thought Antiphilus. The villain has been overreached of all my money. They say this town is full of trickery. Such as simple jugglers who deceive the eye, sorcerers and witches, disguised cheaters, prating mountebanks, and many such like sinners. If it proves so, I will the sooner be gone. I'll go to the centaur to seek this slave. I greatly fear my money is not safe. Adriana, meanwhile, was greatly annoyed with her husband for not returning, and it was useless for her sister Luciana to counsel patience. When Dromeo came back, and instead of bringing his master reported his strange behavior, Adriana became more incensed than ever. "'Go back again, thou slave, and fetch him home,' she commanded angrily. "'Go back again, and be new beaten home?' said poor Dromeo. "'For heaven's sake, send some other messenger.' hence prating peasant fetch thy master home cried the irate lady threatening to strike him dromio thought it discreet to obey but he went off grumbling you spurn me hence and he will spurn me hither if i continue in this service you must case me in leather when the man had gone luciana rebuked her sister for her impatience saying that probably her husband was kept by business but adriana would not be soothed she was full of jealous anger, declaring that she stayed at home neglected, while her husband amused himself abroad with merry companions. He was certainly tired of her, and had found someone he liked better. Self-harming jealousy! Fie! Beat it hence! said Luciana. But Adriana paid no heed to her wise counsels, preferring to make herself unhappy with groundless jealousy. Antiphilus of Syracuse, on reaching the centaur inn, found that his gold was perfectly safe, but he was still extremely annoyed with Dromeo for his ill-timed jesting, and when the slave appeared, he asked him what he meant by behaving in such a fashion. Was he mad that he had answered him so madly? Dromeo, of course, replied that he had never seen his master since he parted from him until that moment, and he further asked, What did his master mean by such a jest? Enraged, by this apparent fresh impudence on the part of his slave, Antiphilus began to beat him soundly. But both master and man were to be still further bewildered, for at this moment up came two ladies, one of whom addressed Antiphilus as if he were her husband, and began to reproach him for his unkind behavior. Ay, ay, Antiphilus, look strange and frown, she said. Some other lady has your sweet expression. I am not Adriana, nor your wife. The time was once when you would vow that never words were music to your ear, that never object was pleasing to your eye, that never a touch was welcome to your hand, that never meant was savory to your taste, unless I spake, or looked, or touched, or carved it to you. How comes it now, my husband? Oh, how comes it, that you are thus estranged from yourself? Ah! Do not tear yourself away from me. Plead you to me, fair dame? I do not know you, answered the bewildered Antiphilus. I have only been in Ephesus two hours. I am as strange to your town as to your talk. I cannot understand one word of what you say. Fie, brother, how the world has changed with you, said Luciana. When were you wont to treat my sister thus? She sent a message by Dromeo to tell you to come home to dinner. By Dromeo? said Antiphilus. 
by me echoed dromio who of course was not the one she had sent by thee retorted adriana and she repeated the answer her own servant had brought back antiphilus began to think he must be dreaming and had been married to adriana in his sleep but when both the ladies insisted on his going back with them to dinner he allowed himself to be persuaded and determined to see what would be the end of this strange adventure as for dromio he was told to act porter at the gate and to let no one enter unless he wanted another beating end of section fifty two recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section fifty three of the shakespeare story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the shakespeare story book by mary macleod the comedy of errors part two confusion worse confounded dromio of ephesus who for the second time had been sent in search of his master at last found him antiphilus of ephesus had been detained at the shop of a goldsmith angelo who was making a chain for his wife the chain was not yet completed but was promised for a little later antiphilus returned home bringing with him as guests the goldsmith angelo and a merchant called balthazar but when they reached the house they were refused admittance no argument or entreaty would induce the porter or the servants inside to open the door they said their master and dromio were already at home and that these must be impostors antiphilus at last went away in a rage saying that he would go and dine somewhere else where he was treated with less disdain meanwhile inside the house luciana was not at all pleased with the way her supposed brother-in-law was behaving to his wife and when they found themselves alone she took him to task about it antiphilus of syracuse again persisted that adriana was no wife of his in fact he said he very much preferred luciana herself luciana did not think it right to listen to such speeches and went off to fetch her sister leaving antiphilus more than ever charmed with her gentle grace enchanting beauty and wise discourse while he was musing over this and thinking it high time that he should leave ephesus which seemed to him inhabited by none but witches angelo the goldsmith came that way bringing the chain which antiphilus of ephesus had ordered as a present for his wife antiphilus of syracuse to whom he handed it in mistake of course knew nothing about it and declared he had never ordered it but angelo insisted on his keeping it saying he would come back at five o'clock for the money antiphilus had already sent dromio to find out if there were any ships sailing from ephesus for he did not want to stay a single night in such a queer place he now resolved to go and wait for dromio in the market so they could get off at the first possible moment angelo the goldsmith was in debt to another merchant and now the creditor began to press for his money angelo replied that the very sum he owed was due to him from antiphilus he expected to receive the money at five o'clock that day and if the merchant would walk down with him to the house he would discharge the bond antiphilus of ephesus however saved them the trouble by walking up at that moment angelo asked him for payment for the chain which of course this antiphilus declared he had never had angelo protested that he had given it to him only half an hour before antiphilus indignantly denied it the merchant creditor now lost patience thinking angelo only wished to escape by some false excuse and he ordered an officer to arrest him angelo 
feeling that his reputation was at stake, then ordered the officer to arrest Antiphilus for not paying him the money for the chain. To add to the confusion, at that moment up came Pedromio of Syracuse, who, mistaking this wrong Antiphilus for his own master, told him that a ship was just ready to sail. He had got all their goods on board, and the vessel only waited for them and the skipper. Antiphilus of Ephesus thought this was his own Dromio, and that he must be losing his senses, but he had no time to debate the matter now. He bade him hasten home to Adriana, and get from her a purse of ducats, which would serve to bail him from arrest. Dromio did as he was told. He rushed to the house, stammered out his confused story, got the purse from Adriana, and is returning with it when he happened to meet his own master, Antiphilus of Syracuse. To him he handed the purse. Antiphilus was quite unable to understand this new freak, but not caring to waste time in explanations, asked if any ship were departing that night. Dromio replied that an hour before he had brought him word that the bark expedition was just ready to sail, when Antiphilus was arrested. Here is the money you sent for, to deliver you, he concluded. The fellow is distracted, and so am I, said Antiphilus. We wander here in illusions. Some blessed power deliver us hence. Adriana, with Luciana, hastened to the release of her husband. But when they found him, he had such strange things, declaring that he had not dined at home, and that he had been locked out of his own house, while she, Luciana knew quite well that he had dined with them, that every one thought he was mad, and he was bound and carried away home, and put under care of a doctor, his man Dromio being also treated in the same way. Not long after this, Angelo and his merchant creditor met Antiphilus of Syracuse, who this time, instead of denying he had had the chain, at once admitted it. Angelo reproached him with having denied it before. Antiphilus declared he had never done so. The merchant said they had heard him with their own ears. The end of the matter was that they all got so angry that they drew their swords and began to fight. Adriana, coming up at that moment, thought it was her husband who had got free from his bondage, and called to the others not to hurt him. He was mad, but to seize him and take away his sword. Antiphilus of Syracuse, seeing that he was likely to be overpowered, slipped with Dromio for refuge inside a priory, near which they were standing. The abbess refused to give them up, as they had taken sanctuary there, though Adriana vehemently demanded her husband. Luciana advised her sister to appeal to the duke, and as it happened, the duke himself now approached, on his way to attend the execution of the luckless Aegeon who up to the present had not been able to obtain the money for his ransom. Adriana told her story to the duke, who thereupon commanded that the lady abbess should be summoned to his presence. At that instant a servant came rushing up in terror to Adriana, saying that his master and Dromeo had got loose, and had tied up the doctor, and were beating the servants. "'Peace, fool! Your master and his man are here,' said Adriana. What ye report to us is false. But the speedy appearance of Antiphilus and Dromio of Ephesus showed that the servant had spoken truth. Unless the fear of death makes me dote, said Aegeon, I see my son Antiphilus and Dromio. There was still some further confusion, for this Antiphilus had no knowledge of his father. But when Antiphilus of Syracuse came from the priory, and the two sets of brothers stood face to face, Matters were soon happily cleared up. To add to the general joy, the good abbess turned out to be no other than the wife of Aegeon. There was no difficulty now about getting ransom for the merchant, and in fact, the duke pardoned his life without accepting the ducats which Antiphilus of Ephesus offered. Antiphilus of Syracuse could now pay his court without rebuke to the lady who had so charmed his fancy, and Adriana to whom the duke had spoken some plain words, promised to be a less shrewish wife for the future. Among the gay company none were merrier or more delighted than the true Dromios. They embraced vigorously, 
and gazed at each other with admiration. Methinks you are my glass, and not my brother, said Dromio of Ephesus. I see by you I am a sweet-faced youth. Will you walk in to see their gossiping? But each brother was too modest to walk into the house first. So they settled the difficulty by going in hand in hand, not one before the other. THE END Wells Gardner, Darton and Company Limited, 3 Paternoster Buildings, London, England. Transcriber Notes Uncertain or antiquated spellings or ancient words are preserved. The illustrations have been moved so that they do not break up paragraphs and so that they are next to the text they illustrate. Both Thisbe and Thisbe appear in the original publication and have been preserved in this e-book. End of section 53 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida End of The Shakespeare Storybook by Mary McLeod